the Assembly of God Church up the hill. Um, and then, of course, on Tuesday, we have a luncheon here at our church. Um, Teresa Kendall from the um, Presbyterian Church is going to be speaking. I think I'm supposed to be emceeing that. I can't remember, but I will be there. <laughs> and so, um, so make a note of that. Um, and then also then on Wednesday, there's a noon luncheon at the Presbyterian Church with Father Joe speaking. And then Thursday, there is a dinner at the St. Mary's Center with uh, Pastor David Baker um, speaking at that one. So get that up on your board. Hopefully you can make some of those uh, meetings for Spiritual Life Week. That's really all the announcements that I have. Um, are there any other announcements that need to be mentioned? Well, why don't we stand then? And we'll open in prayer and then be dismissed to other songs. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the chance to honor our mothers and, uh, and consider the important role that they play within uh, your kingdom, within your church. And, and Lord, we just ask that you will uh, bless this uh, service this morning, that uh, our hearts will be open to the work of your spirit, that we'll hear your voice clearly that we will be brought together in unity even as we sing and worship you, that we'll be reminded that we are a family and that we will be encouraged and even convicted when necessary to really function like a family should function in your eyes. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name.
take a few minutes and greet those who are here this morning. Go ahead and find our seats. What I believe. So I, I love this devotional. I don't know how many of you um, have read any of Charles Spurgeon, but he's um, a very, um, Tom could tell us, he's, he's like an old guy, like way a long time ago guy. And um, <laughs> one of the church fathers, is that correct? Could I say that? No, no sorry. Not one of the church fathers. <laughs> Who is he? Church tell me. Fathers were in the 70s, the 70s, oh. Oh, what do I know? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> he still lived a long time ago, though, so <laughs> there we go. Um, and I read this, and one of the things that he talks about a lot is sharing faith. And I think what God is um, telling me, <coughs> excuse me, is to share my faith more. And that is something that I have been, I think, convicted of. Um, I know there are people that I'm around all the time and that I pray for, um, and I talk about church, and I talk about, you know, I, I drop those little hints that I go to church, but I don't necessarily talk with everybody about Jesus. And sometimes that's not, the, not a uh, convenient thing or not right in the middle of class or whatever, you know, school stuff. But um, I do feel like I am being prodded to talk about Jesus more. And so that is my... Um, that is something God has been, I think, working on my heart right now. Um, but in this morning's devotional, I just really liked this. It doesn't really have anything to do with what I just said, but I just like this. But um, um, it's talking about um, the man who was healed at the pool, had no idea who Jesus was. Um, and then as he goes down, he, he just says these two sentences, which I think it's just really interesting to think about in terms of the people around us. 
The Holy Spirit makes us penitent long before he makes us divine. And those who believe what they know shall soon know more clearly what they believe. And I, I thought about that, that sometimes we, we look at someone and, we, and maybe we've shared Jesus with them or maybe they confess that, but they don't necessarily act that or walk in the way that we would think a believer would walk. And I thought that was just very good to remember that, that we are penitent long before we become. I mean, we might be sorry inside, we might, but it takes a while for us to get, um, for people to get to those places. And so uh, to me that said, be patient with others, be patient with myself. Um, so that's just where God has been working on my heart is to share more specifically Jesus with those that I know. So I invite others to do, to share. I finally finished Gentle and Lowly. <clears throat> um, yeah, well, I read a ch chapter every day. So, <laughs> and this was something that struck me and it just kind of reminded me of lots of things in my life. I'll read the quote first and then talk about it. It says, and if the point of heaven is to show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness, then we are safe. Because the one thing we fear will keep us out, our sin, can only heighten the spectacle of God's grace and kindness. It means that our fallenness now is not an obstacle to enjoying heaven. It is the key ingredient to enjoying heaven. Whatever mess we have made of our life, that's part of our final glory and calm and radiance. That thing we've done that sent our life into meltdown... That is where God in Christ becomes more real than ever in this life and more wonderful to us in the next. And those of us who have been pretty squeaky clean will get there one day and realize more than ever how deeply sin and self-righteousness and pride and all kinds of willful subconscious rebellions were way down deep inside us and how that all that sends God's grace and kindness soaring and we too will stand astonished at how great his heart is for us. What I liked about that is because I have had a life where you know, fortunately not, you know, massive things. When you think about the, quote, sins of life and these big things, you know, I haven't had big ones, but God's been, in a good way, not in a, con you know, condemning way, but in a good way, revealing more of my pride and self-righteousness to me through lots of different things, between being a wife, between being a mom, between my working friendships, all of that. And I'm just so grateful that I'm not waiting to heaven to realize that. I'm realizing that now, which, again, makes you even more grateful for God's heart. reading my gentle and lowly book yeah does anyone else want to share maybe something that um that might relate to mother's day or i could share tons of those but i don't want to take a lot of time yes rosita just wanted to share one of uh, the promises that i've been standing on it comes out of psalms 34 19 the righteous person may have many troubles but the Lord delivers her from them all. I read that just last week. Yeah, I did. Thank you, Karen. Well, God just did something for me this morning that is still bringing tears to my eyes. My breakfast is a large iced coffee from McDonald's, and I go through there every morning, and... <laughs> Um, there's a little gal ahead of me this morning. I wasn't paying any attention, but making a judgment call. She looked like she could have been a single mom, maybe not much money, an older car, a little baby in the back. And uh, she goes through, and I go up, and the lady says to me, she just paid for years. I'll talk about God dropping somebody in your heart to pray for. You know, I don't know her name. I don't know what her situation is. I was making a judgment call that maybe wasn't true, but that just blessed me tremendously. <laughs> That pay it forward thing used to happen quite a bit. That happened to me once in line for coffee, too. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Anything in particular that some, well, I think Rosina is, is, is about to come up here and do some, a Mother's Day presentation, so maybe she has part of that. I'm not sure what your plan is, so... Last, last call for last call for sharing. Okay. Oh. 
right. Well, in the Bible, in Deuteronomy 5, 16, it tells us the commandment. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you. And so this morning we want to take the opportunity to encourage and love and honor our mothers. And so Katrina and Lillian are going to help me. And um, we're going to go through this. You each get, uh, this is a magazine, uh, just an encouraging mag magazine for women. And then this is a devotional and a journal that goes with it. And then if you look around the church, there's um, cups, mugs with flowers. And so just be looking around to see which one you want. And the girls are going to um, bring to you your books and whichever flower you want. But um, a couple of quotes that I found, C.S. Lewis says, children are not a distraction from more important work. They are the most important work. And Charles Spurgeon said, you are as much serving God in looking after children and training them up in God's fear and minding the house and making your household a church for God as you would be if you had been called to lead an army to battle for the Lord of hosts. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I just said. <laughs> Very good. Um, so the first uh, person that I would like to honor is Mary Gebhardt for her faithful example of love for every single one of us. And so if, Katrina, you want to take one of those and then just ask Mary which flower she wants. And while you're doing that, I will go. Mary is right here, our, our stable uh, woman in our church family right there. <laughs> So thank you, Mary, for leading the way for us. And then uh, the next two people we would like to honor is Charlotte and Lucky. And we're honoring them for their hard work, their perseverance, their selflessness. And, their and Charlotte just shared this last week, her desire to end faithful and strong along with her daughter. You guys are such an example to us. And so if you could take uh, two books for them and then um, ask them which flower they want, uh, you can go ahead and take another one for Lucky, too. They're right in the back row back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wave so that they, these girls get to know you. All right? And then Ginny at the piano over here, um, we want to thank her for her faithful commitment of sharing her talent with us every week. Thank you. And then um, the next person, Gabe, I'm going to have you come up here and maybe you can deliver Peggy's to her, Peggy and Jesse, as a faithful mother whose daughter comes home every Sunday and comes to church with her, which I think is just such a blessing. So Jesse and Peggy, thank you. You want to take two books for Jesse and Peggy right here and then they'll tell you which flower that they would like. All right. Katrina, um, the next person, Donna. we'd like to honor Donna for her loving, sacrificial, caregiving heart. Thank you, Donna. Marianne, we'd like to honor you as a mother to many in heart, service, kindness, goodness, and love. Thank you, Marianne. And Mary, we'd like to honor you as a mother who I just found out was blessed by having one of your children on Mother's Day. And um, I consider you a woman of strength. So thanks, Mary. And she's right here, Gay. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Karen. And we'd like to honor Karen for being a loving mother who knows what her most important job has been in her life. Karen. And then Melinda, we'd like to honor you for as a woman of patience and the peace of God's loving care. And she just told me this morning as she's waiting on her apartment that um, patience is a vir virtue. So she's at the back row there. And then Becky, I'll let you do your mom. Uh, we'd like to honor you, Becky, for your heart of unconditional love consistent encouragement, and loving support. Thank you. And then Amber, we'd like to honor you as a mother for being a good steward of God's faithful teaching to your children with love. And then Jennifer, she's back there in the sound room, and we'd like to honor you, Jennifer, as a helpful, giving servant of God. 
and she's she's stepped forward in service today and she's doing she's like she's doing everything today <laughs> she's got some good treats for us at the end too and i really hope that i didn't um miss anybody and so um just she's got hers yep yep i think we got everybody so thank you and it's just such a privilege to be a mom and we just wanted to make you feel special and loved thanks thanks kids also if you didn't get the one you want and you see some uh, flower that you uh, would rather have because we want you to go home with the one that you want you can trade at the end <laughs> Stand. That was so fun, Rosine. I just have to say that. You know, when I think of Mother's Day, I don't know why, but I think of um, Anna Pfeiffer, probably because she has seven kids. <laughs> but um, this song, I was thinking of Mother's Day, and, and this song came to my mind because of Anna Pfeiffer, because she'll often, when she was here, ask me if I'll do this song, Heart of Worship. And it's an old song, uh, but it's still worth doing. And so, so I picked it out today just for Anna. <laughs> Give you all my words. 
Our scripture reading comes from 1 Timothy chapter 5. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. (coughs) 
Yesterday, um, we are, we have Children's Church. I didn't want to announce it because I didn't know. <laughs> Children's Church can, are dismissed. Um, yesterday, we are reminded of a very simple principle that we all know. You cannot win a race if you're not in it. You cannot win a race if you're not in it. Of course, every year, my daughter Olivia and I, no matter where we're at, seemingly watch the Kentucky Derby together, whether on the phone. <laughs> and in the last few years, we have not been in the same place. I think pretty much her whole life. Um, there was a horse. He was not in the race. Until 30 seconds before the deadline on Friday. 30 seconds! Because a horse scratched. They didn't want to be in the race. And so with 30 seconds to go, he became the 21st horse allowed into the Kentucky Derby. Now, because of that, of course, he was put in the absolute worst position to start the race in, gate number 21. And he was 88 to 1 at the beginning. I guess he did get it down to 80 to 1. He was the least likely horse to win that race. And yet, if you watch that race, it's not just that he won the race. It was watching how much faster that horse was coming down the home stretch than all of the rest of the horses. It looked as if all the rest of the horses had kind of gotten their position and they were spread out over probably 20 links. And they never moved except for one horse who was like third from last at the time. And in the last home stretch, just flew by every horse, the horse that wasn't even supposed to be in the race, and won the Kentucky Derby. What's that have to do with this passage? Well, it has a couple things to do with this. It has to do with the fact that as Christians, we have to be in the race. You can't win the race unless you're in it. You cannot be a Christian and sit in the stands with a fancy hat. You cannot win the race that Christ has put before us. First Timothy, Second Timothy are the two letters where this whole idea of race is brought up. I have fought the good fight. You know, I have run the race. Now is for the prize. All Christians are called to be a part of a race. No Christian is called to sit in the stands with a nice hat drinking a, whatever it's called, some kind of mint julep or something. That's not what we're called to. We're called to be engaged in the race. But I want us to think about mothers in particular, but I want us to think about mothers in the home stretch. You know, you can live a big chunk of your life completely in the race, but out of the race, just like Rich Strike did. You know, he was out of the race till the home stretch. Guys, a lot of ground can be made up in the home stretch. Too many Christians think that the home stretch is a time to retire. It's a time to take it easy. Sometimes, if they haven't run a very good race up to that point, they feel like, well, it's too late to do anything. It's too late to be a part of what God wants to do. I missed my opportunity. They should... Take a lesson from Rich Strike. It's never too late. If you're in the home stretch of your life, you need to think like that jockey on that horse. You need to think, I can win this race. Because I am empowered by the Spirit of God. And strangely, I think we just can accomplish more when we get to that stage in our life. Because people aren't expecting anything from us. Nobody's expecting the horse that's in second or third to last with 80 to 1 odds to do anything in the home stretch. And no one will forget what he did. And the same is true, I think, of Christians. And in particular, today, we're focusing in on mothers and grandmothers and women. And many of us, let's be honest, we don't want to admit it, but we're in the home stretch. Not all of us here but most of us. <laughs> most of us are in the home stretch. And this is our opportunity to make something of it. 
1 Timothy 5, I think ironically, and you'll see by the end, is a passage that it depends on whose hands it's in of what you'll take from it. In my library, I have about 30 commentaries on 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And if I chose the commentaries often written by mainline Christian commentators or people who don't even call themselves Christians, they come to this passage and they say, look it, here is Paul in his very worst, showing just what a chauvinist and misogynist he is. That's what they read in this passage. I come to this passage and I look at it and say, here is Paul at his very best, especially when it comes to women, because if you really would pay attention and you really would just pay attention to the culture he's dealing with, Paul is affirming something that is crucial for women, and in particular, in this case, widows and older women to never forget. You are still needed. You're still needed. God desperately needs you. Families desperately need you. In fact, it's kind of odd because those same women who sort of have fought throughout this last century for women's right to work, I would argue they should have used this passage as their, as their text. Because one of the things Paul is going to say here is women need to be working. They need to be engaged in productive activity. And we should not create systems or situations where they cannot be a part of productive activity. Now, Paul may have different ideas of what productive activity is than we do, although I don't think he would have an issue with what we think of as productive activity. I think maybe the difference would be, as Paul would say, being about the family, being about children and grandchildren, and, and honestly, being about raising the, 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 the support and funds necessary for the survival of that family is a great business to be about. It's a great productivity to be about. But let's come to the passage, and let me show you how I think it just sort of breaks down into a couple of different ideas. One has to do with honoring these widows. How do we honor them? And one has to do uh, with, okay, if we honor them this way, why is Paul so bent on certain widows that he's talking to not become idle? Not have a situation where nothing is expected of them? And why is he worried that if that happens, they will fall prey to being busybodies, gossips, saying things that they shouldn't, going from home to home and creating problems rather than constructive help in those situations. Why is he worried about that? And then, of course, the question I'm going to raise at the end is, if Paul was writing today, who would he address those comments toward? Would it actually be young women who are widows, or would there be another target of his concern in those verses? And I, of course, believe there would be another target. In fact, he might target our whole society. Um, so we need to start with a little historical background. In the first century, there are very few women that can work in culture. I know you're thinking Lydia. You're thinking Phoebe. Guys, they are such a rare exception that when their names come up and we learn what kind of successful business women they were, it is remarkable. It's meant to be remarkable to us. It's interesting that Paul puts them forward as people of example when almost no women in that culture would have been in that position. And yet he still holds them forth as an example. Maybe Paul knew that a day would come when women would be in that position. And he wanted to put those people forward as a great example of how to be a godly Christian woman leader. Uh, but in his day, those women are so rare that a preacher probably wouldn't even bring them up. The reality is that women were completely dependent on their families for survival, for the most part. First, they were dependent on their fathers 
and the family that they grew up in. And they would stay in that family because if they left that family, they would starve to death. Or they would have to sell themselves into slavery. They would stay in that family until they became married, and then they would be in that family. And then that husband's responsibility would be to keep that person, that, his wife, alive. Her survival is dependent on it. Consequently, when we come to this passage that's going to talk about widows, in the first century, this means way more than it means today. Just because of different cultures. When a woman lost her husband, when her husband dies, she is in absolute, complete, desperate circumstances. She is totally reliant on somebody else stepping forward to take care of her or she will die. She cannot like we can today. If your husband died, no matter how old you were, it wouldn't matter back then. You could be 20 years old. Your husband dies. You're not going to go out to the local marketplace and get a job, you know, selling, you know, meat or something. There were no jobs like that, which is why, unfortunately, many women who lost their husbands, there was only one job available to them. And what was that? Prostitution. Obviously, that was not a job that Paul felt should be available. So he is looking at this situation. We have a problem. He's not the first one to look at it this way. The Jews had looked at it this way. They saw the same dilemma. That's why in the Jewish system, the temple had a whole system on how to take care of widows. Both the Jewish system and the Christian system, I think, are coming from the Old Testament because we are reminded that God's heart is with the widow and the orphan. And that he is their protector. And we are told over and over again in those passages, if you take advantage of them, you will answer to God. And those passages are pretty clear that if you really want to press your luck, take advantage of a widow or an orphan for your own benefit. Because I'm going to say, you're not going to have to wait until the final judgment. God will act a lot quicker than that on those people who do that. That's what he says all the way through Proverbs and some of the prophets. And because of that, both Israel and I think Paul recognized, as God's people, we have to be about God's heart. And God's heart is for these people. We need to be for these people. So now he comes and he gives Timothy some advice on how to handle this. Because in Paul's mind, there's more than just one issue at stake here. We think the only issue, because we think like, honestly, 20, 20th and 21st century Americans, we think the only issue is here, how do you provide for them? And when we think provide, what do we think of? Money. How do I provide the finances that will enable them to buy food. That is not what Paul is thinking here. He's thinking, how do I provide life for these women? Now, that's going to take money. It's going to take financial or some kinds of resources so they can eat. But Paul would say, you are remiss if you think that is all that these women are in need of. They're in need of something almost way more important than that which will put food on the table. They need something, and he wants to address the church meeting the real needs of these women. So we come to verse 1, and we think, okay, why is it here? Well, it's an introductory verse, I think, to the next several sections. In the next several sections, Paul's going to bring up women, older women, younger women. He's then going to turn and talk about elders, older men. How, you, how Timothy needs to address some situations there. He's then going to talk about masters and slaves and the problem that that's creating, and he wants Timothy to address some situations there. So he begins with these words for Timothy that I think can be applied to all of these situations. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. And then he adds the others, and we've talked about this, don't rebuke younger men, but encourage them 
as you would a brother. Don't rebuke older women, but encourage them as you would a mother. Don't rebuke younger women, but encourage them as you would a sister. Now he adds something here in all purity. Because Paul knows what's coming in the next couple thousand years, even if he doesn't know it's going to be a couple of thousand years of this coming. He knows, guard yourself, Timothy, when you're dealing with younger women. You need to have a certain mentality of purity, actions of purity, as you interact with them. Treat them like your sisters and treat them with all purity. So Paul sets this up to let Timothy know, now I'm going to ask you to confront some people. But I am not asking you to be harsh. I'm not asking you to get in people's faces and let them know what they need to be doing. I'm asking you to encourage them. Of course, this is the Greek word parakaleo, which is where we get the word paraclete, which is the word for the counselor, the Holy Spirit. It comes from two words, to call alongside of. It's basically the idea of a person coming alongside of someone, putting their arm around their shoulder, and gently encouraging them the way they need to go. Just think of the picture of a person walking. And they're walking towards a cliff and certain destruction. The Spirit of God comes along. He puts his arm around my shoulder, and he gently starts moving me <laughs> in a different direction. I might not even notice that he's moving me in a different direction, but if he doesn't do it, I'm going to plummet off of a cliff to my destruction. This is what Paul is saying to Timothy. In all of these situations, as you address difficult situations, there is a way to go about it. And this is how I want you to go about it, about it. Then he comes to this passage about honoring widows. And he says to him, there are some ways in which you need to honor widows. And the first thing I think he's addressing is you've got to make sure you're taking care of their basic needs. But even in this passage, he's going to Hint at, there's another thing you need to be providing for them. So let's look at these verses. Honor widows who are truly widows. Interestingly, does that mean there are widows who are not truly widows? Well, at least from a biblical standpoint or Paul's perspective, I think what he's suggesting is there are widows that we as a church are responsible to, to meet certain needs that they have. There are other widows that we can't. I don't know if he would say that we're not responsible, but I think he would say it would not be beneficial to meet those needs in these particular people. Now, you might divide this into these two groups of widows, which you could take from this passage. One group of widows, the ones that are not truly widows, are widows who have families. Widows with children and grandchildren, or even sometimes parents if they're younger but family members that will be able to take care of them. So some would say that Paul is saying that they're not the truly widows. The truly widows are the widows who are alone and have no one to call upon but God himself. In fact, I, I would suggest that many people take it that way. Now, if that is what Paul means, I think that there's a fairly positive way of thinking of this if you're a widow. Before you're offended by Paul saying you're not truly a widow, I think how you read this is, I am not truly a widow because I am not alone. I have people who love me. I have people that will care for me. I have people that I belong to and who belong to me. Just because I lost my husband doesn't mean I've been widowed in the sense that I'm all by myself. Paul is saying to those women, you're not all by yourself. In fact, in the end, he's going to say it to all Christian widows. You're not all by yourself. You have family, and they will care for you. However, as I read the passage, I'm not sure that's the distinction Paul is making. He may be making a different distinction between the truly widow and the not truly widow. 
that has nothing to do with whether or not they have family. So let's read these verses. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow, and so here's the point in terms of, I think he's referring to the honor part, not the truly widow part. I think he's saying, now, when it comes to honoring, if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. So he says, if a widow has this family, then the primary people who need to be showing honor to them are that family, especially in the area of providing a couple of things for them. It's not just one thing, two things at least. The one thing they need to be providing that we think of is provision for them. And Paul is saying that if you are a family member of a widow, you are first responsible to be the provider for them. And you need to honor them in that way. And then he gives three positive reasons why we should honor our widows in this way. And he gives two negative ones. The three positive ones we just read. First is to learn to show godliness to their household. I want to ask you just a simple question. Is there anybody you're more concerned about coming to know Christ that does not know him than the people in your household who do not know him? Think about it. Whether it's a child, whether it's a brother or sister, maybe a mom and dad, whether it's a grandparent. These people often have priority of place in our hearts when it comes to them seeing who Christ is and coming to him. Paul says, okay, if you really feel that way, show them godliness. Show them what God looks like. Show them what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and a child of the, of the God of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The God who loves and has compassion for widows and orphans. Show them. Learn, he says, to show godliness to their own household. You think, oh, he's talking about to show godliness to the widow. Well, he is. But he could have said to show godliness to their own widows. But he says their own household. He's going beyond that. It's not just to show godliness to the widow who is in need. It is to show godliness to the entire household on how we, as followers of Christ, should act and live. So that's the first reason. He says, you want to be a good example? Do you want people to see Christ in your life? Do you want your child who doesn't know me to see? You could, I've often made this point when I'm counseling with people. Be careful how you treat your parents. Because your children are watching. And I do not care how bad your parent is. Believe it or not, you can have a horrible, horrible parent. And if you respond to their horribleness in like manner, I'm warning you right now, you could be a wonderful parent, but you're going to have more problems with your kid than you would have. Even if you're a wonderful parent and they were a terrible parent, if you treat your parent horribly, your children will learn that from you. Even if they won't be justified as you think you are. And the opposite is incredibly true. You have a parent that has treated you horribly. Honor them. Love them. Pray for them. Show them respect even if they don't deserve it. And watch how it impacts your kids and how they treat you. I've seen it over and over and over again. So consequently... <laughs> This is a great reason to honor these widows that Paul begins with. But he doesn't end there. He immediately goes on to another one. And to make some return to their parents because we owe it to them. That's Paul's point. They took care of you. They provided for you. They raised you. They loved you. You owe them something in return. Guys, this is my retirement verse. 
I mean, I love this verse. I should put it, you know, over the crib of the children, my children when they're born. You remember what I've done for you. <laughs> because when I get old, that's all I'm going to have is them. Um, now, other so you are smarter and wiser and more prudent and you've really invested well and have got great retirements, unfortunately. As a pastor, uh, not so great. <laughs> but you know what I have? I've got great kids. And I trust them that they've read this verse. <laughs> and I'm really relying on God because it's God who's going to move in them. But this verse says, don't forget your parents. You owe something to them. I owe something to my mom. I owed something to my dad and to my grandparents. They have provided for me. Now, remember this. In the first century, that's especially true. Where, you know, I lived in a different home from my grandparents. But in the first century, you might have great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, and then children. And you're the child. And believe it or not, all three of those generations, all the way up to great-grandparents probably, or maybe even more than that, they are all working together to provide what that family needs to survive. That's the way it was in that culture. It's an agricultural culture. And that whole family works. And if that whole family doesn't work, people will not survive. So you are indebted to all of them. And Paul reminds us of that. Honor them because you owe it to them. And then he gives maybe the most important reason for this is pleasing to God. Do you need another reason? Do we need another reason to honor our, our mothers, honor our grandmothers, our parents, than just this? It pleases our God. You know, that one who sent his son, spared not his son, who came down and died on the cross so that we can have life with him. It pleases him. And we don't need another reason than that. However, he will give us two more reasons in the I think it is in verse, five, uh, verse 8. He says to them, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith. There's the negative. If you don't do it, you do realize what you're doing. You are calling yourself a Christian. You're proclaiming I'm a follower of Christ. But your actions are denying what you're saying. In other words, we have a word for that, don't we? Hypocrite. Oh, you're right with me there, Becky. It is hypocrite. When you say one thing and your actions say the opposite, we call that person a hypocrite. So if you don't honor your parents, Paul is basically saying, you are a hypocrite. You are claiming to be a follower of Christ, but you're acting nothing like a follower. You're denying the faith. And then if that wasn't enough, <laughs> he really wants to drive home the point. And you are worse than an unbeliever. This is Paul reminding them that, guys, even unbelievers recognize their responsibility in this matter. Even pagans see their need to care for their mothers and their grandmothers, their parents and their grandparents, even they recognize that kind of responsibility. So if we as Christians fail to do this, it not only denies our faith, but we will be looked upon with disdain from the world. And why in the world would they ever be attracted to this faith that we are proclaiming if we are not even acting as righteously as they are in this issue? That's all about honor. And it's about providing and he doesn't leave a whole lot of doubt here. Now, who are these truly widowed and not truly widowed? Well, I skipped a verse there, didn't I, in verse 5. She, who is truly a widow, left alone, has set her hope on God. The truly Christian widow is a person who's put her hope on God. Now, we might think that that's a person who has no family. No. Even the Christian widow who has a family is hoping in God, not her family. Now, Paul is going to say to the family, you need to step to the plate and honor this woman. But the woman needs to be doing what? Putting her hope in God. Families will disappoint. God will not. So the true widow is the widow, the Christian widow, who has put her hope 
in God and therefore is never alone. The person who is not truly the widow is the widow in the next verse, verse 6. Oh, by the way, I should read the rest of it uh, in verse 5. Has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. She not just hopes in God, she's calling on him regularly. By the way, who does that remind us of? Does that remind you of anybody in the New Testament? A widow who prays night and day, puts her hope in God? Um, comes right out of our Christmas story, right? Anna. I mean, she was 80 years old. And from the time of very young, she became a widow. She spent every day in the temple looking for the coming Messiah. Her hope was in him and prayed continuously day and night. And, and God provided for her through that whole time and also allowed her to be one to see the coming of his salvation. On the other side of this is verse 6. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Paul, I think, says there's another category of people that would be technically widows. Their husbands have died. But they're living their lives after their husbands have died as a means of just self-indulgence. Well, how could they do that, Tom, in a description of the world that you talk about? Well, their husbands were quite wealthy. They came from wealthy families. And this is, by the way, this is what a dowry is actually for. You know how in these cultures, women would have to have a dowry that they bring into the marriage. Uh, people think that that's sort of a payoff to the husband. No, actually it's not. The dowry the woman brought into that family was kept for this situation. If her husband dies, it's that dowry that would provide for her. It's kind of like life insurance. An ancient dowry is like a life insurance policy. Well, if she was coming from a fairly well-off family and she has this dowry, she can now live off this. Paul is going to warn here, these women, be careful because the, the thing that you need provided for you is not just provision of money and resources. You need something else. But if you think the only thing you need is provision and resources and you happen to have those resources because of a dowry or because you, your husband was very wealthy and left you in a place, you are actually in danger of something. You may then live your life in self-indulgence. And Paul sees this as a danger. He's going to pick this up again. You may become an idler, a busybody. Which now brings me to the second way we must honor our parents, a way that we often do not think about. And I think Paul would say is way more important. Yes, you need to provide for them financially. You also need to give them a place in your family where they can feel like a productive member of that family. Where they are given the opportunity to contribute to the welfare, well-being, and in most cultures until a recent, the, the recent one in our country, their survival. In other words, you're to give them a job. You're not just to provide money for them. You're to give them a meaningful, rewarding, productive job. You're to give them work. And this is often missed in this passage. And yet I think Paul is saying, you need to catch this. You really love your mom? Don't just pay her bills. Make her a part of your life. Make her a part of your kids' lives. This is hard. You can see, guys, this is way harder for us to do today. My mom lives 2,000 miles from me. She lives alone in a home. She's 89 years old. She's like Mary. She still lives in her own home. I talked to her this morning. She's doing great. She's going to church. I have so much to be thankful for. Next week, she's spending the entire week with her sister, who has dementia is down to 76 pounds and probably isn't going to live that much longer, but has had dementia for quite some time. And as a result of that, that family has had to, you know, circle the wagons around her and care for her in ways that I don't have to care for my mom. In fact, I think my mom would resent it if I tried to care for her too much. <laughs> She's a little stubborn Scottish woman. <laughs> but she needs to feel like she is a part of our family. 
she needs to know what's going on. So she, she doesn't want to fly anymore. Well, we have a wedding this summer. Well, my daughter is like, well, Grandma, you're coming to my wedding. I'm picking you up on the way through. Well, that means Mom's going to be at my house for a month because <laughs> Olivia's coming in the 1st of Jul July <laughs> picking up Grandmother because there's no way she does not want her grandmother at her wedding because she's a part of the family. That's what Paul is getting at here. You want to honor these people? It's more than providing finances for them. Make their life productive. Give them purpose. Make them feel important to you, to your kids, and to what's going on. Back in the first century, that's, I mean, honestly, guys, they brought them right in and they went to work, work. And they did what they could. And unfortunately, we've created sort of a society that, where we're so separated that this is a lot harder to do, but I do not believe we are any less responsible to try to accomplish it. And so Paul goes on to say what gets him into trouble, which I don't think should get him into trouble. I think it should get all of us into trouble because of where we live and the world that we live in. He says, first, this wonderful thing, which I think is a different group, group of widows. There are some widows, whether they have families or no families at all, the productive work that they need to be a part of is actually work within the church. They're over 60. And maybe this is the age that Paul puts out there, maybe because, of course, they can't have children. But I don't think that's it, because I'm not sure how many 50-year-old widows are going to be likely candidates for marriage and having more children. But I do think what Paul is getting at in this next section about these women over 60 is, you know, there is a time when, when, when women, widows, or just, you know, people in general, they're starting to reach an age that they cannot do as much for their family as they once could have. They still are a part of it. They can certainly do something, and, and they certainly need to be provided that kind of value. But I think Paul is recognizing, but there is a time when we get so old that there's not so much I can do for the survival of my family, my, my actual physical family, but I have just reached the age where I can really do something super important for the family of God. You see, because in the family of God, getting to be 60 is an advantage. In the families in Roman Empire, getting to be 60 is a disadvantage because you can't work in the fields like you used to be able to work. But Paul comes up, well, we can use them because, in fact, they are incredibly valuable to what the kingdom of God wants to be doing. And so he tells us that there is this list of widows, these widows that Paul says, some of these and some of them don't have families, I suspect. Maybe many of them don't. And this is the way that they provided not just money for them, but they provided dignity for them. We're going to make you a part of our family, and this is, the, this is what he says. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age. In other words, if she's over 60. Having been the wife of one husband, that's still that same expression, a one-woman man, probably better translated, she needs to be faithful to her husband. It is not talking about whether or not she had been, you know, had two husbands or three husbands that have died and she's been a widow. It's not talking about whether or not she has been abandoned by a husband. Um, it's not really talking about her life before she ever became a Christian. Because let's face it, all of these people at the age of 60, are you kidding? If they're over than 60, they became a Christian somewhat later in life. It's only been 30 years that Christ has, since Christ's crucifixion. So they, they could not possibly have grown up in the church. So they become Christians as adults. I don't think it's talking about any of that. I think all it's talking about is if they've been faithful. As Christian women in the congregation and their husband dies, have they been faithful in that role? And then he says, furthermore, have they a reputation for good works? Reputation is not strong enough here. What he says here is, are they well known for it? It's not just, do you have a reputation for that? No. Is that what, that's what they think of when they think of you. A person who is about the good works and helping people. A person like this would be um, um, Tabitha. Remember Tabitha in Acts? She 
was well known. In fact, it's the exact same word used there. She was well known for the things and deeds that she had done for the widows in her community. And Paul says, if they're well known for these things, if they have brought up their children, they're known for being involved and faithful in the ch- it doesn't mean that if they didn't have any children, because let's be honest, there are going to be widows, especially this old, that didn't have any children at all. Because I know that because the average life expectancy of a person back then, 60, is already way over it. Well, there's a reason. Because so many women died in childbirth. So some of these women would have had no children at all. But... If they had brought up children, and by the way, even if they had no children at all, they're often in a household where there were children. And those children would have to be brought up because they had, those families were way bigger than what we think of as a nuclear family. And so he says, have you been a part of this bringing up children, raising them up? Notice these sound very similar to elders and deacon qualifications. In fact, they're almost exact. They're almost the same qualifications. Do you have a good reputation? Did you you bring up your children? Are you the the wife of one husband? Are you faithful to your husband? Have you shown hospitality? Remember that one? That was for the elder. The elder has to be hospitable. Have you been hospitable? This one's a new one. Has she washed the feet of the saints? You might think, oh man, she's taken some lowly role. Actually, by this point in the church, that means she's a leader in the church. Because Jesus set the example. And since the time that he sets the example, you notice you will not find in in Christian literature about the slave needing to wash the feet of the saints. Because that was their role in society. But once they walked into the church, guess whose job it was? It was the elders. It was the leaders. So the fact that this woman has been washing the feet of saints doesn't say a thing about her being a woman. It says... She was a leader among women. She was a leader among women. She was seen as a leader, and consequently, she was a servant. And she washed the feet of other women. I doubt if she washed the feet of men. Not in that culture. And I doubt if men would wash the feet of women. This is a woman that was already functioning in a leadership role amongst women, and now she's given a leadership role in the church. Cared for the afflicted. That's just the word for persecuted. If she cared for the persecuted, that means she put her own life in danger. Because people who are persecuted have people who hate them, who are after them. And if you're going to risk caring for them, you are at some point going to be the object of that persecution. Kind of reminds you of some of the people that took Jews in in Nazi Germany to protect them, care for the persecuted. Boy, you're putting your life at risk when you do that. It was the same in the first century. This is a remarkable woman that he's describing. And then finally, and has devoted herself to every good work. She's a category. Then Paul turns to my last point, but refused to enroll younger widows For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry. Apparently, when women were put on this list, when they were put in this position, they made a vow to serve the church. And I I think you would say, remember, he thinks they should be 60. They are making a vow not to get married, but to give their service to this church and this family of people. And so Paul says, I don't want younger widows being given this opportunity because the time is likely to come when they may be drawn away from that vow, drawn away from that commitment because of the possibility of marriage. It does sound pretty strong here. He says they're drawn away not just to marriage, but they're drawn away from Christ. So it seems like he's worried about certain younger widows not just being marrying other people, but marrying non-Christians and being drawn away from Christ. So he has a better suggestion for them. He says, I want those younger widows, I want to see them get married. The implication here, though, is married to who? 
Christians. This will protect them from being lured away by non-Christian men who can provide for them. Think about how that would have been a reality for them, guys. In a culture where the only way you're taken care of is by a husband, and your husband dies, and, and you're, you are trying to commit yourself to a single life, and non-Christian men pursue you. Boy, it's risky there at some point. Lord, I don't really have any choice here. It's the only way I can survive here. Paul says, you should pursue marriage, but pursue marriage of other Christians who are going to strengthen your faith. And then he ends this with this interesting thing which I want to bring to an application. Besides that, they learn to be idlers going about from house to house and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. Hmm. I could apply this to a lot. Idlers. I actually think this is Paul's second biggest concern in the passage. He is imagining, because it's already happening in Ephesus, by the way, we learn about these women in a couple other passages. Their husbands have died. They have resources. They have no productive connection to a family or to the church. They are idle. In other words, they're not doing anything with their life to provide or be productive for the well-beings of other people. All they have now left is to take care of themselves, and they're quite able to do so. Consequently, they have no responsibilities. Paul sees this as dangerous for these women. Because he has watched it happen where many women in that situation became idle. They did not, let's say, when they were in that situation, hey, I've got a lot of free time. I'm going to volunteer my time to help here and help here. I'm going to help this family out. Or the women at the end of the passage, hey, I know some widows that can't take care of themselves. I know some Christian widows in my church that don't have anything. I'm going to use my resources to help them. You see what he's getting at even in the last verse? Are you being productive? Are you helping other people? Or are you living your whole life in retirement for yourself, for self-indulgence? He says a simple lesson we all better learn. You are walking into Satan's playground. It's like a trap shoot for him. When your life is idle, Satan is going to pick you off. You're going to fall to his temptations you're going to become self-indulgent, and you're going to become destructive. Which is why Paul's real point is, make sure you provide meaningful, productive work, life for these people. What would Paul say today when most women, when their husbands die, can go out and get a job anywhere? This would not apply to them. Much of what he says in this passage doesn't apply to a younger widow in particular. Because they can provide for themselves in our culture. I think if Paul was looking at our culture, he'd say, you're right, the women are not the people I'd be speaking to. It might be that 18, 19-year-old guy who can't get away from his computer. That is idleness. Who is basically living off his parents, you know, paid, his parents pay his way to college, he doesn't have to work, sits in his college room, doesn't go to classes, He's set up. He's idle. He's a busybody. It's going to be destructive. Guys, let's be honest for us. Who's he talking to? He's talking to retired people. We are in danger here. When we retire, we can, as Christians, we can never retire from the work of the kingdom of God and productivity even in our families. We cannot. I don't care how many resources we piled up in our retirement. If we think we're going to spend our retirement merely self-indulgent, living for ourselves, Satan will destroy us. And that's who Paul would be writing this passage to. He would say, hey, your widows are in pretty good shape. But some of your men out there, they need to pay, take heed to what I'm saying here. They cannot become unplugged from meaningful relationships and community. I think he would probably say something to our welfare system. And of course, I'm very familiar with it, and I know there are people that are mentally ill that desperately need things. But let me tell you something. 
If all we provide for them is an idle life, they will be destroyed. I have a very good friend. We are having a conversation about work. He's had a hard time getting a job, and he's like, Tom, I don't know if I can get a job. And one of the things that I see in his life, I said, you know what? Here's my, my biggest concern, and you are already addressing it. You can't be idle. You need to be doing something productive. So he volunteers down at the mental health center. He leads groups down there. He's taking classes at the University of Montana, even though he's like 37 years old. And I'm thinking he's taking English classes and math classes. I'm thinking, what are you really going to do with these classes? You're not thinking about a career from it. Do you know what he's doing? He's not being idle. He wants to be productive. And it will keep him out of our hospital. It'll keep him from destruction. Because Satan loves idleness, even in the mentally ill. And it brings about destruction. And it brings about it for us. And that's the real lesson I want us to take from this passage. God wants us to stay busy. Busy about the kingdom. Busy with our families. Busy with work. Being productive in our lives. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this reminder, even though it didn't seem like this is where we're going. And as I think of our mothers and our grandmothers, I just pray that we will be people that are faithful in honoring them to allow them productive life within our lives. That we will care for them, provide for them, but also be a part of their life and have them be a part of ours. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing this last song. Um, you can all stand. I was an orphan lost at the fall, running away when I hear you call. But Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you loved me still. And in love before you laid the world's foundation. You predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cause. Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone, but nothing I did could ever atone. But Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. The spirit you made me see. I swore I knew the way all the rocks, a heart made of stone, but spirit you moved in me. At your 
touched by sleeping spirit was awakened. On my darkened heart, the light of Christ has shown. Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven sin. Mother's Day plan.